Michelle, welcome. I'm so excited to talk to you today and thrilled to talk to you today. We're going to be having a discussion around such important topics about sex trafficking. You are from the International Justice Mission, and it is a tremendous honor to learn from you and to hear as much as we can so we can help with the great mission that you have. Thank you so much, Dr. Leaf. It's a real joy and privilege to be here today as well. Fantastic. Well, can you start by telling my listeners about IGM and about your role and what you do and you know what led you to this role? Yeah, so I'm the Vice President of Justice Solutions at International Justice Mission. And to be honest with you, I was somewhat thrust into working with victims of trauma, restoration, and healing. It was actually the first day of my PhD internship in New York City, and it was 9-11. And so I'll never forget the feeling of walking outside of my internship building in the West Village and seeing swarms of people wow. running and escaping uptown. And I'll never forget, honestly, the image of just the plumes of smoke that were rising from the towers. And as, as you and everybody knows, mm. every single person was impacted by 9-11, oh, yes. both on a personal level mm-hmm. and also on a collective level. And that experience and that, that day, that moment, it catapulted me into the work of understanding and exploring the impact of trauma, both on the individual and also on the collective. Mm. And fast forward, years later, I have the privilege now to work for International Justice Mission as someone who is really trying to understand how to work with victims of trauma and abuse. And so IJM is a Mm. a global nonprofit working to end slavery and violence around the world. So across Southern Asia, IJM works to remove individuals and families out of forced labor, slavery and sex trafficking. And in Latin America, we help defend children and women who have survived various forms of violence and abuse. And in short, we're a community, a global community of investigators, lawyers, social workers, psychologists, and advocates who are fighting for the freedom and protection of the most vulnerable in the world. Mm, and over the last, yeah, over the last 20 years, we've We've really had the privilege to walk alongside thousands of individuals who have been removed from violence and exploitation. And uh, thanks to friends and, and partners like you, we've been able to work alongside local authorities and partners to really work to provide safety and protection for victims. That's incredible. That's such a, I just feel just listening to what you're saying, I just feel so humbled and thank you that you do what you do and thank you for what the organization does. And it's just it's insane to think that we still live in a day and an age where slavery is still happening. And, you know, that your website's so clear about explaining that. But tell us a little bit about the fact that slavery still exists and what that means and what that looks like. Yeah. And so we, the reality of slavery, like you said, is, is so pervasive. And it's, mm. to your point, it's, it's shocking that it still does exist. But the reality is now, honestly, more than ever, there is a real need to protect those who are vulnerable women and children who are vulnerable to violence, men and families who are experiencing violence in communities, in their own homes. And honestly, you can probably imagine uh, while the world is on this global lockdown from the pandemic, it means that those who are experiencing violence in their own homes are now trapped in the reality of that violence with their abusers. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of conversation about being safer at home, which of course is, is, is important given the reality of the pandemic, but it actually also really reveals the greater level of vulnerability for those who are being victimized within their own homes. And that's something that we're really focused on, especially during this COVID-19 time. One example mm-hmm. of, of the work that we're really doing in terms of wanting to understand the reality of violence during this, this particular time is is the work that we're doing in the Philippines. Mm. And so our our office in the Philippines fights cyber sex trafficking of children. (sighs) And so this is a crime that that Mm. takes place when someone halfway around the world pays a small fee to direct the live sexual abuse of a child in the Philippines and streamed over the internet. And because the abuse is being live streamed from a child's home, this means that Children now, today, are more at risk because they're stuck at home during COVID-19. And the studies are showing Uh that this this 
this crime is on the rise. And so our our teams are really trying to be creative in terms of how to remove these victims of exploitation while also trying to follow social distancing guidelines. And, and now more than ever, our teams are really trying to show up for these, yeah. these children who are victims and who are suffering during this, this time. In their own homes. So that, that means the parents are permitting this or the, whoever they're living with. Yeah, it could, be, it could be family members. It could be those who are maybe within the community who are trusted, neighbors. Mm. It's, it's often this crime that's being committed within a small community uh, within the Philippines or other locations as well. Oh my gosh, that's just shocking. I mean, shocking to actually even think that that such evil is happening. I mean, it's just horrific. You know, once you've rescued a bit, and actually just before I jump to the next question, I, you know, if people go to the webpage, they can actually see you've got that, that some stories of, of people that have been rescued and there's that little boy that was used for cyber sex. I mean, you've got a whole lot of them. So I really recommend people, you know, go, we'll put all the links in the show notes that people go to the webpage. It's an incredibly good webpage, easy to get through. And you talk about three major areas that you work on, rescue and restoring victims, bringing criminals to justice, and strengthening justice systems. So I thought maybe we could just talk about that, each of those aspects. So once a, once a victim is rescued, the hard work of healing really begins. But before we start with that, could you just give us the big picture overview of, you know, that you rescue and you restore victims, you bring criminals to justice, which is so good to hear, and you strengthen justice systems. What does that look like? If you can answer that in a big questions in a simplistic way. Yeah. So, I mean, Exactly what you said. So our investigators will often conduct undercover investigations to find and locate the children or those who are being abused. So I'll stick just primarily, let's say, with with the work that we're doing in the Philippines with cyber sex trafficking of children. So our investigators will partner with the local authorities and they will really work alongside these local authorities and partners to remove the children from exploitation and to arrest the abusers. Mm -hmm. And like you said before, Mm -hmm. you know, oftentimes, these abusers can be family members or trusted people within the community, Mm -hmm. individuals who have a trusted relationship with these children. So that is a massive complexity that our teams are Mm. trying to work through. Gosh. Uh, And then IJM lawyers and uh, partner lawyers will then take the case through the legal system because we want to ensure that these people will no longer be able to commit these crimes. And so we are really committed to wanting to ensure that these cases can be taken through the legal system. So as you can imagine, Mm. then it's absolutely critical that IJM aftercare teams, which is social workers, psychologists, and, and partner and government social workers, they really have to walk alongside these victims, these, these survivors who are on their journey of restoration and this this journey, as you probably know, you know, it involves the immediate crisis care. Yeah. It's the ongoing counseling that's needed. It's the support that that individual needs to go through the legal process. Mm-hmm. It's the the other needs that arise for that individual or those those children who are removed from that exploitation. And so, it really is just this multi layered wow. process that that we that we do alongside. Uh, governments, local authorities, and partners. And and that's really, in our minds, the sustaining piece of the work. We really want to build the capacity mm. of the local system. We really want to work alongside the system that already exists in the, in the context where we work. And so we focus very much on strengthening the local system, the local authorities, and those who will continue to build the system in those contexts where we work. So ultimately, our vision is really to ensure that the protection of the poor is possible. And and we really want to ensure that individuals are able to live safely and sustainably in their communities. And we want to also build the capacity of the local systems where we work. I love that. I love that. that is, because that, that is the effectiveness, isn't it? If you don't build the local strength, how are you going to be able to root it out? So you're really equipping coming in with specialists, but you're coming in with the view to educating within the system and then improving their effectivity. And is, is the effectiveness, is it working? Do you find that that's, that approach is working? Absolutely. I honestly can't oh. think of a, a more critical way in which to engage mm-hmm. the the context where we work, because these are these are authorities and these are systems and these are partners and local NGOs 
who want to see people to end in their communities. Mm-hmm. Yes, and they want to see the end of violence in their communities. And so mm-hmm. oftentimes it's really about just walking alongside them, mm-hmm. you know, providing training, really helping to equip those systems, identifying alongside them what the gaps are in those systems and how mm-hmm. to augment those needs and those gaps within the system. And so it, wow. it really has been an, an incredible uh, process of just really partnering with local authorities and local partners in those contexts. Well, it makes so much sense because they know what's going on inside their communities. So it makes so much sense to bring your expertise and their expertise together. And that way you can root out the crime and start moving forward. And I'm sure it has a, an exponential effect as you have success with one victim, it's going to spread the news and then people will start working together. Do you find that happening? Do you find more and more people coming into the fold to help fight this? I really do. I mean, I think that it takes time to be able to build trust within those contexts and with those authorities and and with those partners. But I think that there is this this sense of like a common goal. And the common Mm -hmm. goal is really wanting to to really bring protection and sustainably bring protection to people in those communities. And so I think Mm -hmm. that we've really seen that happening in many of these places where we work because there's the focus on the individual and as you as you make an impact on the individual, there's a ripple effect and the yeah. community is impacted, then the districts are impacted and then the nation is impacted. So there really is a, a ripple effect. That's wonderful. And you've seen that happening. That's such, that's incredible. So it's really working, but you just have to keep the, you have to just keep it going. That's the whole thing. It can't stop. It just has to carry on so that there's a sustainable protection and the sustainable identification and rooting out of the evil, which is incredible. Well, once a victim has been rescued, you mentioned already that there's a lot of hard work that needs to be done in these different stages that the person goes through for for the healing to take place. So how do, what is the process that IGM uses to help victims deal with the trauma? I know it's a big question. So it, obviously you break it out however you want to. Yeah. So, so this is, I love talking about this because I really have seen the deep impact that this has had in our process. Actually, that, sorry, that was probably a bad beginning, but I'll no, start no, here. No, 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 you're excited. It's wonderful. <laughs> okay. So I, I love actually talking about this because our vision is to see these public justice systems yeah and social services form a, an ecosystem mm. where survivors are protected Love and they're that. empowered to really grow these roots of safety and stability. Mm. So we have multiple ways in which we really try to see that happen. I would say that the, the lens through which we really approach protection and safety and stability for, for victims is, is trauma-informed care. So we really see trauma-informed care as this critical approach to interacting with survivors. And and as you know, trauma-informed care really recognizes that there is a complex and very nuanced impact of trauma. Mm -hmm. And we want to really help to equip and train and help systems understand Mm -hmm. the impact that trauma-informed care can have on a survivor and a victim as he or she is going through the pipeline of of his or her own restoration. Mm -hmm. So when the social services and public justice system, they're able to work hand in hand uh, and they're able to be equipped with the basics of trauma-informed care, Mm -hmm. they can really help to form an ecosystem that protects a survivor and really helps to ensure that the survivor is safe and protected. We also really work quite a bit with partners to ensure that partners are able to be really trained and equipped in trauma-informed care processes. And so we really, all around, as, as each individual is engaging with the survivor, we want to ensure that they are really trauma-informed in the way that they engage with the survivor. Oh, good. The other piece that's really important in our work is a number of years ago, we developed a grassroots tool that since then we have uh, validated, and it's called the Assessment of Survivor Outcomes Tool, the ASO. And Mm -hmm. really what it does is it helps to measure a survivor's progress towards restoration. So we really want to understand what are the areas of vulnerabilities and strengths in a survivor's life? And mm-hmm. how do we really design the care plan for the individual so that that person is moving towards restoration? Mm. 
So good. And so we actually, it was, it was developed in one of our offices in India years ago. And since that time, we've actually rolled it out globally. That's and we've awesome. actually now come to a place where we share it to various organizations for free. That's so it's amazing. validated tool. Yes, yeah, it's, it's really helped us in terms of our own programming. And it also has helped us in terms of really understanding both what needs to happen on the individual level, but then also what needs to happen at a program level. Mm, so that's the so tool, good. Because they work hand in hand. I mean, you've got to have the program recognizing the in- complexity of the individual's response. And so you've got to have the two that you don't just put people through a cookie cutter kind of design that you actually rec- And I'm hearing that your tool does that. It's your validated tool is looking at the individual's response to trauma and how that may be manifesting and then adapting the program. Is that correct? Is that how you... So we really look at six main areas of a person's life because we want to be holistic in our service provision. And to your point, you know, there's no one exact cookie cutter approach. You really need to have these six areas in mind for our programming, but then really tailor them to the individual as they are going through their restoration Mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. So we look at six main areas. So we look at safety. So is the person free from threat or the experience of victimization? And are they also like, able to stay safe? We look at number two, legal protection. You know, do, do survivors know and are they aware of their rights and protections in the law? And then we look at mental well-being. We want to, yeah. of course, understand the individual's level of stability and their mm-hmm. coping skills and also their own level of risk as they're, as they're really going on this long-term journey of recovery. Yeah. And we want to understand economic empowerment and education. So, you know, does the individual have a safe source to meet their needs? Mm. And then we want to look at social support. That's just so critical. You know, mm. does the individual have supportive relationships and are they accepted in the community? And is the community able to come alongside that individual? Mm. So important. And then finally, we're looking at physical well-being. You know, does the individual have the ability to, to take care of basic needs and basic medical services and, and safe and stable housing? So we're really looking holistically at these so areas good. of an individual's life. And as we're able to then, you know, look at that person's journey and really and understand that person's journey that helps to inform also on a broader level our programming as well you know what se- what tends to be mm. most critical in a in a survivor's journey of restoration and mm. and does that tend to be similar maybe with a particular case type that we're trying to to combat in a certain region or a certain country mm. so it's really been another critical piece in our own journey with survivors and through our programming and so we, we all survivors who come through our programming are given a baseline evaluation with the ASO tool. And then at some point midway through their programming. And then we also then conduct the ASO evaluation at the end of programming because that will help to determine mm-hmm. is that person able to remain safe and stable? And if so, can they exit out of the program, program the aftercare mm-hmm. program? And then we conduct the, the evaluation one year after release. So in the, when they're in the program, are they removed from the, the dangerous environment and into a safe house? Are they removed? So every time when they go through this, they're in a safe place where they can get the medical attention initially and the psychological attention. Critical for us to make sure that that person is able to be in a safe, a safe environment. Sometimes that means that they have to be placed in a shelter. Sometimes they're able to return back to the community to someone who is a safe person. Mm -hmm. So there's various scenarios depending on the region, the case type and the situation around that case. Mm. So do you find that that's, it's, is it quite difficult or easy to find people within the community that will look after that person and if the perpetrator or perpetrators are still around or your whole plan is to actually get them into the criminal justice system and to get them through the legal system so they away that the perpetrators away but what I'm trying to say is that if you if they're back in the same community how do you protect them from if you from the people that you don't find because the chances are you won't catch all the perpetrators so we always want to ensure that if the individual is returned back to the community and is able to 
be in a safe place within the community, that there is protection from the potential perpetrator if the perpetrator is still within the community. If we don't feel like the individual is able to remain safe in the community, then that person will be normally in some sort of temporary shelter or home until we can ensure that there is safety in the community. The ideal is to really have the person in the community. Because yeah, that's what I was, yeah, that's realistic. That's what they're used to. It's the natural environment, et cetera. Yeah. Exactly. And there's, there's so much protection that can come from the community, but we want to obviously ensure that it's a safe, it's a safe environment. So if it's not, then there normally has to be some sort of temporary housing that's provided to the individual or a shelter. I love that approach. I love that you try and reintegrate as safely as possible. And then you've got the IGM support. They're not just left alone. They've got, you've got the constant supporter. I want the viewers to actually realize that IGM doesn't just pull them out and put them back and leave them alone. You actually with them all the way, making sure that all six of those pillars are addressed and that there's going to be the sustainability and the ongoing protection, which is amazing. What kind of therapies are you using to deal with the trauma what kinds of interventions? We focus on a TFCBT, so trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. And, and as you know, it's, it's a modality that is proven to be very effective with trauma survivors. And so we really evaluate the level of intensity of trauma therapy that is needed for the individual. Okay. So we really try to work alongside partners in the community who can provide oh, that's therapy. Great. Mm -hmm. And we've also worked quite a bit with teams who are able to train partners in TFCBT. So Mm -hmm. we really are wanting to ensure that there is a very clear understanding of trauma, the impacts of trauma, and the types of interventions that are effective in working Mm -hmm. with trauma survivors. So there's there's a there's an emphasis on ongoing counseling to ensure that the individual is able to receive the support around his or her own trauma experience. We also focus quite a bit on community support. Mm, I love that. I was about to ask you about that. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as you know, I mean, the community can be such an important and critical buffer and protection for the individual. And so we've actually recently been working alongside survivor leaders who are really wanting to build up local survivor groups in their own communities. That's fantastic. It's amazing. And so we have seen that in the Philippines. We have seen that in areas where we work in India. These natural, organic communities of support mm -hmm. of survivor leaders who are saying, we want to build this protection within our communities. We want to be create these local groups of survivors who can serve as a protective barrier for survivors who is, who've experienced trauma. And then we want mm-hmm. to go out and we want to advocate. We want to raise awareness within yeah. communities so that others can also avoid being re-victimized. That's so amazing. Amazing. It really has been a, just an incredible process to see survivors really taking the reins in that way. Are you, so are you getting people within the community, like family members and, and just other, just general people in the community helping with almost training and uh, someone who's inexperienced to actually know how to listen carefully and help support maybe behavioral changes that occur from trauma. And so you're using the, the grandmothers, the mothers and whoever to try and help because you can't always wait for the therapist to go in. There's, there's not always that practical. So is that what you mean? You're drawing on the community to facilitate the mental healing? Definitely. We are really trying to engage communities where we work and survivors are not, survivor leaders are naturally engaging communities. I would also say the survivor leaders themselves are really the ones who are championing this sense of like, what does it mean to help our community stay safe? Survivor leaders. I just want to under, yeah, so people that have survived have gone back in their communities and they are, and are they doing some counseling too, or sort of support on a, the survivor leaders helping back and helping new, new survivors come in? Do they kind of feedback is a kind of feedback system going on exactly and so there are survivors who have gone through after care programs in in many of the contexts where we work and they are then either joining existing local survivor groups or they're helping to start local survivor groups and these survivor groups are communities of survivors who provide support for one another after they have exited 
program, aftercare so programs. Good. And they're mm-hmm. now trying to advocate in communities, advocate to local governments wow. and authorities about what is needed for the protection and safety of survivors. Mm, and they would know firsthand, wouldn't they? I mean, they've just been through the process. That's incredible. Absolutely. They are the, they are the experts in terms of yeah. what is it like to experience trauma and then also what is needed to recover and to be restored from trauma. And so they are truly the subject matter experts around mm. what, what violence is plaguing the poor and how to actually advocate on behalf of what is needed. And so we have seen organically these local survivor groups being formed in these communities. And they, these local survivor groups are led by survivors wow. who are now saying, I demand change in my community. I demand wow protection. And we see that in the Philippines, we see that in India, and they are truly catalyzing a movement in in what it means to be protecting their community. And then also a lot of these local survivor groups, they will undergo training. They will say, you know, this is the type of training that I would like to see um, Mm. in my own community and in my own group. And so actually just even this morning, at 5.30 a.m. Washington, D.C. time, we engaged in a training on advocacy and storytelling. And so it was about 25 leaders scattered throughout our offices in South Asia. And we are training these staff members who will then train survivor leaders on how do I tell my story? How do I share my narrative? And how do I share what it means to be an advocate in my own community? And so we we just went through that. Yeah, it was incredible. It was just this morning and it was such an incredible opportunity. I could just see, I, I, I can just see that, you know, I'm so glad you said narrative. I'm so glad that you mentioned that you're talking around training around the narrative because it's through the story that they can really experience. And, and in that, I'm sure the survivor is going to feed back to the professionals that if this behavior manifests, this is what I experienced when I did this is because of that. So we, instead of us going from a theoretical point of view, you can actually go from the feedback of the survivor. And that's a huge movement globally across the, the like a, almost like a response that's happening at the moment with the survivor network, which is growing and growing and growing because the current biomedical model hasn't met the need of trauma across the globe, just for humans in general, you know, and the narrative and the person, the victim who's gone through it to be able to feed back through their narrative of what they need and what they experienced and why they did what they did. Um, I'm thrilled that you have got that kind of an approach because that can only grow and enhance and really lead to healing. Mm-hmm. I think that's that's absolutely true. We yeah. are really understanding the critical need to ensure that survivors are speaking into so good. what we are doing and our mm. approach in aftercare and our approach in restoration and healing because they have experienced mm. it. Yes. So they can tell you what they need and then you can bring the tools to, to get the criminals, get the legal system going, get the financial structures, get the social structures changed and so on because they don't maybe have that skill, but they can tell you their pain and what they've gone through and and guide the process. So it's a two-way street for, to move forward, which is amazing. Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what I'm realizing also in this in this stage as well, just being able to see they have a unique perspective and they are truly experts in terms of understanding mm. what their experience is and also what they really believe is part of the restoration process because they've gone through mm, that process. They've gone through that. I love how you said they're experts. It's something that I say all the time. We can't be an expert on someone else's feelings. You know, and I think there's a lot of, there's a trend. I mean, you and I are both in that world where we've gone through all the training and expertise and degrees and whatever, but we're still not an expert on someone else. You know, we, we are an expert on maybe processes and so on, but it's the person who's gone through it. We have to listen to their story. You know, I just did a a series of clinical trials and we evaluated the whole mind-brain connection and we looked at one of the biggest components for us was looking at the narrative. So yes, we can do all this. And I've also got a scale that I validated and we looked at all that for the psychological, but we looked at the narrative as being the main component and then looking at how plays out in the brain and the physiology and the neurophysiology and that kind of thing. So, and that's where you really see the insight into what the person needs and then you can really help. So that's wonderful approach that you have. Yeah, I, I really do think that there is this deep power to your point around mm. the narrative. What is the narrative that a person has experienced? How mm. does that person understand that narrative? And then how does that person communicate that narrative? Exactly. You know, there's there's this journey yeah. of being able to go through that. Because it's hard to, to talk about that narrative and to know how to break that down and to know when you need to stop for the day. And that, there's so many things around the narrative of trauma. 
Right. I think that that's exactly, exactly the case. And I think it's how do you help individuals navigate that personally, but then how does that, how does that individual help others navigate that? Beautiful. And then really as a, then the collective impact that that the connective. Has yeah. That we're, as we're able that. to all understand our narratives. I love that. I don't know if you've heard of the friendship bench in Zimbabwe. Have you heard of the research done and Harvard was involved where granny just sat on a log, literally that's how it started helping people just with whatever they went through, come and sit and just talk to her. And it became such a successful form of mental health intervention. They called it friendship, the friendship bench. And it was literally the communities listening to each other and then the professionals noticing and kind of coming in the way that you have. And it's been it's been one of the most effective mental health systems. But, you know, it's not spoken about because it's not a drug or something you can patent. But it sounds so much like what you're doing in your approach as well is, is using the community to, and the survivors specifically. Incredible. Wow. So the, I, I was going to ask you, what do you find some of the most effective elements for helping victims heal? And how does the community play a part, which is what you've pretty much described? But what are some of the most effective elements within, is it the narrative? Is it the community? Effect? Is it all of it together? Can you, could you identify maybe a selection of the elements? I'm going to pause for a minute. So the elements of? In terms of effective elements for helping victims heal, what are the main things that would help? What are you seeing in the healing and the transition as they, let's say you've got someone who's gone through the whole whole they've been rescued and they've gone through the whole program and now they're one of your community leaders so they are the a leader and um, but they're a victim they were previously a victim so it's the survivor leader so what are the elements that got them through that process to the point where they can now reach out and help others yeah, i do think that what's what's really critical for individuals is to understand the important pieces for what helps to promote restoration in their own individual lives, but then also to be able so to good. understand how are they able to then share that to others. So there's this piece about understanding the personal mm -hmm. component, but then there's the piece about being able to share that to others as well. And that sharing piece, I think, brings empowerment. Mm -hmm. It brings a sense of being able to, a sense of power and authority in their own lives, empowerment in, into their own decisions and their own choices. And there's also a sense of being able to bring change as mm. well, change in the community, change in their own lives, change in their family. And so there's really been a, a neat a process to see how individuals go through their personal journey. And then that personal journey becomes a journey that they're able to share with others and the impact that that has on others. Mm. And so we've really um, focused quite a bit on that in our, this, this lo the local networks that are developing in, in various contexts. And that's really the, the goal of the training that we've been doing in terms of the storytelling and the narrative, really wanting to help empower individuals to share their story, to share what they think is critical in terms of bringing others to understanding what they've experienced and what brought about change as well. Mm, that's fantastic. So in terms of your training that you did this morning, just today at 5.30 with your various offices around the globe, in terms of narrative, what are some of the principles of learning how to tell your narrative as a trauma victim? Yeah, so it's it's based on a train that comes out of Harvard, and it actually is about the story of self, the story of us, and the story of now. And mm -hmm. so, what we're really trying to understand self, is this, us, and us now. and now the three elements. So the, okay. So the story of self is like, what are my values? Like, what's a moment where I was faced with a challenge? Mm -hmm. I had a choice that I had to make, and then there was an outcome. And those things were centered around like the values that I personally have. And so we each took turns today and we, we had to brainstorm and think about a moment where there was that could help to capture the story of me, like mm -hmm. what has formed who I am and what has formed the choices and maybe the direction that I've made as an individual and as a leader. And then there's a the story of us. So it's like, what are the values that join us together? So even you and I, you know, mm -hmm, there's, mm -hmm. there are values that you and I share around wanting to see healing brought mm -hmm. to others, wanting to see wholeness, mm -hmm. holistic restoration for individuals, mental well-being, mm -hmm. physical and psychological mm -hmm. well-being. So what are those values? What's the us that you and I share in together? Mm -hmm. And then what's the story of now? You know, what's urgent? Like what needs to happen? So I would say like, even in this conversation, the urgent piece is just raising awareness about Venus. the reality, mm. raising awareness about the reality of those who are still suffering in violence 
how can I as an individual, how can you as an individual, how can each person who is listening help to respond to that urgent calling and that urgent now that needs to happen? And so that's what we're focusing on the on the, the public narrative training that we're going through is really being able to understand what's the story of self, you know, and what's the moment where I have had to make a choice around my values. What's the story of us? What are the values that 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 we share collectively? Mm-hmm. And what's the story of now? What what's what do we want to see happen? Mm-hmm. What's the urgent thing and desire that we have? Okay, so the self would be beautiful. I love that. So the self would also in, in, encompass the trauma that they've gone through. So part of and and that and it would be and you do it in stages. So and then and how the us also shifts the us and the tra- the perpetrator, the us and the this the per- people who help them heal and so on and so on. So it's a whole. It's a, It's got a whole lot of parts to it. And it takes time. Are you finding this narrative approach effective? We really are. I, I, I really do think that there is this critical piece of people being able to understand the moments in their lives that have shaped who they are, but to also feel like there is an ability to, to not stay stuck in those moments. Lovely. Mm, that's so and good. There, there is an ability to say, yes, this has happened. This is part of my narrative, but mm. this is not my whole narrative. Love these it. are moments yeah. and these are pieces of my story. And I am going to make a choice of how I allow those moments to impact my narrative. And so I really do feel like there is this shift because there is a there is an ability to stay locked into one narrative, like the narrative of being a victim. Yes. And or the narrative of, mm. of being someone who is continuously in a cycle of not being able to get out of that yeah. anxiety or depression. Or that narrative of like, I can never be a good person. Whatever mm. that narrative means. Whatever it is, yeah. Whatever it is, mm-hmm. but there is a need to really want to shift that. And I think that this, this process that we're going through is really trying to figure out, like, are there ways and moments in which we can turn that around? Mm, that's beautiful. Just to undergird what you're saying, I found this in my research recently, the most recent clinical trials, that when you increase awareness through starting the story, you then lead to a level of autonomy. And as soon as someone recognizes, okay, this is my story, I've got the autonomy to shift that story, they then can start looking at the toxic issues and the toxic stress around that issue, the trauma, et cetera, as something that's a barrier and a challenge, but it's something that can be overcome. And there's such a distinct shift. So it's like a pathway to empowerment. And it starts with the whole process of, and the narrative definitely helps to unpack that I can become aware that I'm not stuck there. That's not just one isolated, stuck thing. It can actually shift and change. It's organic and developing. And that you have a lot of ability to drive that process. You know, so I just wanted to say, because that, that we showed from the research that people can 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 get that kind of level of control up to in, uh, improve by up to 80%, which is incredible, just through that mind work. So you're doing such a great thing there. That's why I'm so interested in the narrative because I've seen the effect in, in my work as well, that it's such a great tool. I'm so glad you, and I'm so glad you're using it. It's wonderful. You guys are just incredible what you're doing. Absolutely incredible. So what are some of the biggest challenges to a victim's healing? There could be multiple, multiple aspects of, of challenge. I think that there is definitely a challenge around the trauma bonding. So the reality is, you know, individuals can be trauma bonding. Be this, that's, that's very significant. Yeah. This bond to the perpetrator, whether it be maybe, you know, someone who has trafficked that person or someone who continues with the ongoing violence or abuse. And so that I think is a very real thing that our teams are often facing. Mm -hmm. And so I think with that then comes sometimes distrust for those who are trying Mm -hmm. to help the individuals or walk alongside the individual, whether it be the social worker or the case manager or the lawyer, whomever it may be, there can be this mistrust. I think also one of the challenges can be when you say the mistrust, if I may ask you this, so the trauma bonding to the per- to the person who's hurt them, they kind of now that that's overgeneralized or generalized to everyone. I can't trust anyone. Anyone who's telling me to do something is someone I can't trust. Is that exactly? Okay? Yeah. So there's that 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 same sort of sentiment trickles mm-hmm. into other to relationships mm-hmm. and other things, especially as maybe those who are working alongside the individual, maybe the social worker is trying to raise awareness for the individual with the, the reality of trauma mm-hmm. bonding. Then there's this sense of like, who can I trust and who can't mm-hmm. I trust? Mm-hmm. Who is on my side and who is not on my side? Because if I felt like I could trust this individual, how do I know that I can't, I can't trust another person? Mm-hmm. So the, just the, the reality of 
the struggle to be able to know who's trustworthy and who is not trustworthy. I think the other really difficult challenge that we face is especially in our work in the Philippines with the cyber sex trafficking, many times the victims are really young and they're siblings. And so as you can imagine, there's it's these siblings a, that are doing it. So it's the very young and it's the siblings that are actually the being perpetrator. abused together, or maybe the, the person, the perpetrator is having the siblings inflict violence and abuse on one another. Oh my gosh. And so there is the challenge of that reality of the their family young bond. Mm-hmm. family bond is broken and they also unfortunately sometimes have to be separated if they're placed into yeah. to various forms of shelter care and so then mm-hmm. the the only person who is connected to them they soft, oftentimes have to be separated from the sibling mm-hmm. and so that's a really big challenge that we're wow. facing in the Philippines with the work of cyber sex trafficking just the reality of very young children and how to really address trauma with young children who often don't understand the full extent of what is happening and Mm. uh, how to really engage them in the process and also how to really help with the the bonding experience for the child if they are placed in foster care or in some sort Mm. of temporary housing or a transitional housing, like being able to bond with the individual who is their caretaker. Mm. So that's, I think, another really big challenge that we're facing. Mm. I think the other piece too is just the reality of the intensity that is required around trauma work. So the counseling. Mm. Which is how you're addressing the challenges. It's the intensity of the counseling. The intensity of the counseling and needing to have the resources, both in terms of partners who can provide Mm. the counseling and the therapeutic work. And then also just the resource to, to be able to provide the adequate amount of Mm. care that is needed for someone's mental well-being. And so that's, Mm. I think, another massive challenge that we face in many of our contexts. And very hard to to deal with that because it's a resource thing. You need enough people to be able to help because it's for a young child. For anyone, it's going to be a lot of intensive interaction in terms of therapy. But in terms of that's where you've got to draw in the community, the collectivistic approach. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to do meet everyone's needs, would you? So that's a huge part of it. Yeah, that must be really, really hard. Okay, so what about secondary trauma? How do you and your team and all the volunteers at IGM deal with the secondary trauma? Do you see this terrible stuff happening? It's just, just listening to it, just seeing the videos can make you feel a level of trauma. But if you're immersed in it and you're actually saving a child from that situation, there's that secondary trauma. Can you speak about that? It is the secondary trauma is such a real is such a real phenomenon that I think we are really trying to constantly address and curb both at the individual level and at the organizational level, mm-hmm. and so we're really trying to ensure that people are aware that this really does exist. Yeah, this really yeah. does happen. Yeah. You know, there is just this this constant flood that can happen from the exposure mm-hmm. to trauma, and and as you know, you know, it often looks very similar to PTSD. You know, mm-hmm. so you have the yeah you have the tendencies of like the, the triggers that people experience mm. or the, the negative emotions or being hyper aroused. Yeah. Or hyper all vigilant. Of these, and, hyper mm. vigilant and all the intrusive thoughts. And so mm. we're really trying to ensure that there's the awareness at the individual level. And really we have, we provide counseling for, for your counselors. Yeah. For staff and dedicated counselors in each of the regions where we work, who work regularly and regularly with staff. We also have a peer support program. And so we really want to ensure that there's individuals within the office who are trained to be able to maybe identify if a staff member is experiencing some sort of secondary trauma or Mm. is needing to engage, because sometimes that person won't actively seek that out. Mm. And so mm. we want to also build in some mechanisms they can, with- to read because they, they've got it like, well, I'm here to help. I've just got to deal with this kind of attitude. And then they're breaking on the inside. Yeah, exactly. So really wanting to ensure that there are eyes and ears All, within the okay. office who are really able to identify that. And then I would say, of course, there's the individual level, but then there's the organizational level. And as an organization, International Justice Mission needs to be committed and is committed to really ensuring that there is awareness and there is care that is given to individuals. And so Mm. we have minimum standards that are in place in terms of the the trainings and the tools and the processes that need to be in place. Mm -hmm. And we also have policies and practices. We have regular rhythms of engaging in the work and also 
disengaging and and really resting from the work. Mm -hmm. And so our organization has done a really phenomenal job around building in some quarterly times where we all just walk away from the work collectively. Mm. And we collectively really go back to a place of um, trying to find some strength and some joy and some recentering in the work that we do. So important because that goes hand in hand, doesn't it? The secondary trauma with compassion fatigue. Absolutely. Yeah. And so I think that we really see both of those happening. So the the secondary trauma, I think, is is a very real piece. The compassion fatigue, I think also, again, sometimes it's just hard for staff to even recognize that maybe their emotional, physical exhaustion is because of the The trauma, the Mm -hmm. compassion Mm -hmm. that they're experiencing, Mm -hmm. but then also the secondary trauma that they're experiencing. Mm -hmm. And so there is this heightened sense of awareness that like, sometimes I, I, maybe I need to just keep going. Why do I, you know, my, why do I need to step away from the work when the, the victims or the survivors really need us to engage in the work? But what has really been emphasized is this important need for mindfulness around mm-hmm. being mindful of how am I emotionally, physically, mentally engaging in the work, you know, and really being able to take time to be reflective, to mm. slow down and to really stay centered. And to give themselves permission to do that, isn't it? Don't Because they kind of feel, as you just mentioned, that there's so many people that need help. How can I take time on myself? That's, you know, that, so it's to be able to give the compassion to yourself as well and to take that time because there's a lot of guilt around compassion fatigue. You feel like you've got to keep going and then you don't realize that there's that maybe depression, signals of depression and anxiety and that's, oh, I'm burnt out. I can't do this anymore or whatever. What's, what's wrong with me? Meanwhile, sometimes it's just to stand back and have a little bit of a a reboot that your brain can't keep up with your mind. It gets tired with all that lots and lots and lots. You've got to pull back a little bit. So do you find that people battle with that, with giving themselves permission, that they almost feel guilty that they're feeling tired or feeling maybe a little depressed from seeing all this sadness? I think that that's a very real a real piece that is talked about in our organization. Mm -hmm. The reality of of holding on to this and doing this work that is very difficult. Mm -hmm. It also wanting to not feel like we are the ones who need to fix the problem, but we are really trying to engage it's so good. as best as we can yeah. with the skills and with the training and with the the capacity that we can. But understanding that we are not the ones who solely need to carry the work, you know, mm-hmm. but we really need to be able to find that balance. And I think that the only way that the work is sustainable is if there is that 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 recognition. That I can do what yeah, I can do what I can and I want to do all that I can, but I can't ultimately fix it. I can't ultimately be the one that is going to do the work on my I own. I love that. I think you've hit something that's very rela- very, very close to the core of the heart of compassion compassion fatigue, which is the desperate desire to help someone and wanting to just continue to help someone and trying to fix them. But you bring the recognition that you can't fix someone else. You can just support someone else and, and you've got to keep yourself almost like fresh. You've got to keep yourself almost recharging your battery like a cell phone and otherwise you're going to wear out. So that, that and if you remove that, I've got to fix it from the equation, we will give ourselves a bit more compassion. This daily practice that we have where in the mornings we just take about 30 minutes to be mindful and to just slow down and to to honor the moment and to to really be able to be focused and centered in 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 the day and i think that that really helps it's it's a it's a discipline and it's a practice and i think that that's a critical piece critical uh, in terms of really ensuring that the work is sustainable Mm, and that's something that is applicable just in general in life. If we make sure that we are filled up, that we've got enough to help others, we can become much more of a collectivistic society. We become very self-focused when we burnt out as well. So it's a matter of balancing. I love that you said that to take that. Could we pivot to telling a story, perhaps just a short story about someone's life who's changed as a result of IGM? I know there's thousands and thousands, but maybe someone stands out in your mind that you could just share a little story, obviously respecting their privacy. I would love to share the story of Ruby. And I, I asked her permission oh, good. Um, okay, before wonderful. sharing today. And let me just bring you into her story. So she, you know, by the age of 16, Ruby had witnessed tragedy that I think no, no person, no individual should ever have to experience. And so she was born in the Philippines and her parents were farmers and they were trying their best to earn enough money to feed 10 children. And Ruby wow. was, Ruby's the youngest of 10 wow. and wow. her parents died within a year of each other. And mm. that left Ruby 
vulnerable to having to fend for herself at the age of 16. And so it was during this very dark and difficult time that she actually received a private message on social media. And that message was a promise for a better life. So the recruiter took advantage of Ruby's vulnerable situation and offered her a job at a computer shop and said, there's free food, housing, and you'll have the opportunity to take classes at night and after you work. And they even offered to pay for her travel from her hometown to a place that was 400 miles away. And so to Ruby, she felt like this was, wow. this was her ticket out mm-hmm. and that it was going to be her path out of poverty and into a life of independence. Mm. And Ruby, upon arriving at this, this location, everything came crashing down. And she actually shared in her own words. She said, quote, it felt like a bomb exploding in my head Mm -hmm. after seeing half naked girls coming out from one of the rooms. She said she remembers that place was covered with windows and guards outside patrolling Mm -hmm. the, the house. And everything that Ruby had thought was promised for her was a lie. Mm -hmm. So she was actually bondaged because of the travel fair debt. And she was a debt that it was impossible for her to pay. And she would be forever trapped in that. And so she was actually sexually exploited and the recruiter exposed her online to pedophiles and sexual predators all over the world. And, Mm -hmm. And that's the the crime that I was talking about before it's mm-hmm. called sex, cyber sex trafficking. Yeah. So her, there was the live sexual abuse of children who was streamed via the internet. And the reason why the Philippines mm-hmm. is a hot spot for this particular type of crime is because there's widespread internet access. Mm-hmm. And then also there's English language skills. And so it, individuals like Ruby are often trapped in this form of modern day slavery. It's terrible. And Ruby shared these words with me. She said, you know, never in my whole life had I anticipated to experience the horrors of trafficking, witnessing and doing things I could hardly imagine as a teenager. I blamed myself for being trapped in the dark world. I felt disgusted by every action I was forced to do just to satisfy customers online. I lost my self-esteem and I felt so weak. And Ruby said that she would yell every time she would hear a police siren go by, but no one could hear her and no one came to her rescue. But she said that one day, IJM, alongside Philippine authorities, they located Ruby and they were able to rescue Ruby and five other girls. And not only was Ruby removed from that exploitation, but she actually demanded change. She wow. said, I have experienced this and I do not want to see this happen again. So I am choosing to engage in the trial against these traffickers. Wow. That's incredible. It was incredible, but it took four years for the trial to come to an end. And the traffickers were sent to jail and they were there, for, they will be there for 15 years. Wow. Ruby said, you know, very honestly, it's been a long process. You know, the process of restoration, the process mm-hmm. of struggling with my own anxiety and depression and even suicidal thoughts. It's been a journey. It's mm-hmm. something that has been so difficult. And still to push through and for four years and not give up and, you know, you, to still fight for the rights because she was thinking of others not going through the same thing. So in the midst of her own pain, she fought for four years against, and they eventually was stuck, got to jail, which is fantastic. She had, to your point, she had to fight. She had to oh. re- remember those memories. She had to mm-hmm. testify about those things. She was wow. the witness and she was the victim and she was wow. the one who was abused. So she had to share her experience oh. and had to essentially relive that experience. Oh my God. But she, she demanded that there was change and she demanded that wow. something had to happen. And she knew that she wanted to make the choice to be a part of that change. Wow. Uh, the amazing thing is that Ruby is, is now graduating with her BA in English. That's she incredible. has a daughter who's five years old and who is full of energy and joy and who I had the opportunity wow. to meet. And she is now advocating on behalf of others who are That's victims incredible. of this crime. 
Wow. It's and that's, really incredible. That's incredible. And that was IGM found her and helped her through this whole process. That is absolutely incredible. Wow. You, you, at least those stories are the things that can encourage you to carry on because there's so much negative stuff. So that's good that we have the stories to help us to see that there's, there's, we've got to keep doing this. We've got to keep helping the rubies. Thank you for sharing that story. Please tell her that we, we thank her from the bottom of our heart for being open to share that story. How can people get involved with IGM? Because people need to get involved with IGM. GM and I'm imploring people to really listen and see, listen now to Michelle, how you can get involved with IGM. Yeah. Thank you so much for asking that. I honestly, COVID-19 is, is such a unique and difficult mm. time. And so, like I said before, the work that IGM is doing in the Philippines to rescue victims like Ruby, it's urgent. And it's, it's even more urgent during COVID-19 mm. because people are, are really trapped in these stuck in their homes abuse. they are stuck in their homes and they and it's very and close so quarters exactly and so there is a real desperation and a need for mm-hmm. individuals to be removed from exploitation but then when they are removed to walk in that journey of healing and so mm-hmm. what i would love is to just be able to invite individuals who are listening to be able to fund the trauma focused cognitive behavioral therapy session mm-hmm. for survivor of this particular crime, cyber sex mm. trafficking, for one hour of therapy session, you can help an individual like Ruby really receive the trauma focused therapy that is needed. $45 is all that is needed wow. for one session. And for 90, it can be two sessions. And this is mm. the journey that someone like Ruby has gone through because of generous supporters and donors. And I am really hoping that other individuals who are listening to this podcast will be urged to really Mm. contribute to funding the critical need for trauma-focused therapy for individuals. And so you could visit Mm. IJM.org backslash Dr. Leaf, and there you can help to contribute to the therapy sessions for individuals like Ruby and for hundreds of other children who are also being removed from cyber sex trafficking. Mm, That's incredible. So that's something very practical that you may not be able to get to the Philippines, but you can... You can help fund someone's therapy, and you, the, the details will be in the show notes. So go to the go to the go to the website, see what you can do. Take this on as a challenge because we need to help each other. We need to collectivistically get together, and here's an opportunity for you to change someone's life. Michelle, thank you so much for your insight, your wisdom, and for sharing Ruby's story and for sharing everything that IGM is doing. It's just phenomenal, and I cannot thank you enough for the fantastic work that IGM is doing. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Thank you.